Let's review some of the other parameters we'll be adding to our list that we're making of each patient's presentation. And we can talk about the microscopy in terms of casts, cells, crystals, or microorganisms, or all of those. And each are found in, in the urine in varying degrees, like casts, but some of them immediately indicate that a pathology is present. So we'll talk about what's normal and what's not normal. Let's look at the first one, which is a cast. A cast is like a mold or a copy of the interior of wherever uh, the thing comes from or forms. So do remember that a, a nephron is a series of, uh, it's a tube that's connected. And so a cast is going to look much like the tube from um, in which it formed. Let me just go to that slide and you'll see that this is long. This granular cast here is long and it looks much like the tube where it was formed. Here we have another one that's in a tube shape of white blood cells gathered together and here again are epithelial cells. Notice that white blood cells and red blood cells could just be free like this. This is their normal appearance of cells in the urine, but if they form a cast they look like the shape of the tube where they were formed. So let's go back to the cast slide and note that they're often uh, cylindrical in shape formed in the tubular lumen of the nephron, right? And the things that form the cast, like proteins, anything that precipitates out can form uh, a cast inside of the tubule. There's lots of different things that could form casts Lots of different types of cells, hyaline, epithelial, uh, all the way down to the red blood cell and the white blood cell. Look at this, it's formed in the distal convoluted tubule and the collecting ducts where most of the urine is concentrated. The presence of these casts usually indicates a pathology, a bad thing. You don't want to see casts in the urine sample. Um, these protein acidification and increased osmolarity, which means just the, you can think of it as a saltiness or the solute concentration. The urine is getting very concentrated, so the specific gravity is going to be um, very high compared to the amount of urine present, which will be a low volume. Remember, that's uh, inverse. So let's look again at some pictures of casts. Here we have a granular cast and here we have a white blood cell cast and an epithelial cell cast. The main thing to note is that a cast is usually pathological when you see that in a cell. Uh, I'm sorry, in a sample. Let's look at cells in the urine. Types of cells that could be in the urine. Gosh, um, all types. Fat cells, squamous cells, red blood cells, white blood cells. Uh, you know, white blood cells meaning leukocytes. Any, any, anything that could indicate an infection. Um, urothelial multinucleated giant cells, not anything you need to know for this class, but just examples um, of cells that could be in the urine. It is normal, however, to exfoliate epithelial cells, the lining of the renal tubule, uh, just because of the nature of what's moving through the tube. There's solutes in it, and that just, just like your skin sheds, so can the inside of the tube shed. So the takeaway from here is just that wear and tear, uh, the things moving against the wall, the fluid with the solutes, the sediments moving against the wall, will just knock off some of the epithelial cells and exfoliate the inside of the lumen. However, we could see cells like uh, white blood cells to show us there was an infection or there was ischemia or a tumor. So we could see other cells that are pathological but oftentimes we'll just see epithelial cells and those are normal. Let's see, we would do a sediment analysis for, uh, to diagnose some cancer, etc. Let's just note what the epithelial cells would look like in the urine. And you can see here, they look just like your average skin cell that you would uh, look at under a microscope. So they look much like those little flattened squamous cells that we're used to we're used to seeing, and that's fairly normal presentation, but we always have to rule out the abnormal. Now the last one we'll look at are crystals in the urine, and the crystals in the urine can be the product of um, 
food that's been eaten that has a high purine content uh, or drugs that have been taken and it could be the end product of just cellular metabolism. It really depends on the pH and how hydrated that urine is, how hydrated the patient is really because the hydration of the patient is directly reflected in the volume of urine. So a few crystals is okay, but a lot of crystals will form a renal calculus. And in these situations, we'll have an acid or a neutral or an alkaline. So really the type of urine will determine, uh, I'm sorry, the, the crystal, the type of crystal is going to tell you what the pH is and then the pH will tell you what you could possibly put into your uh, into your decision tree, into your diagnosis, trying to figure out which which crystal it is. I'll show you that. Abnormal crystals, things that interfere with the flow of urine and the comfort of your patient, are, are associated in this exercise with uh, acidic or neutral urine. But you could have alkaline urine, of course, and you could have a really, a really profound renal calculus called a staghorn calculus with... Um, with a basic or an alkaline urine, but that's not part of this laboratory. So let's just stick with what's in the lab exercise that we're gonna see. Here are some uh, paintings that Dr. Netter did, and also some imaging that you can see the actual calculi in situ, meaning inside the kidney uh, in a patient. So here we can see some multiple small kidney stones, these small calculi, and you can see them over here on the screen uh, in the patient's kidney. Now the kidney, um, you can't really see much of the kidney here. I can see some down here too. But you can see the, uh, the kidney stones. And you can see those on x-ray. And then also we can look down here and see a bilateral uh, staghorn calculus uh, on either side, and the staghorn is really, you can imagine, let me just show you a picture of a staghorn calculus. Now there's our stag with the prongs sticking up, and of course it would feel just like a stag, but not only does it feel like you've been stuck by one of these, it looks like it too. So you can see over here, that staghorn would look like this. Here's what it really looks like. And if, you know, this kidney has been removed, and so this kidney, uh, this kidney failed. And I don't know if this kidney was taken out of a patient who was deceased or if this kidney was removed while this patient was living. But in any event, this staghorn calculus here has interfered and we can see necrosis and all kinds of bad things going on here. So that's a staghorn. Here's a list, don't memorize this list, I've highlighted some things in here that you might want to be aware of, but do not memorize uh, the types of crystals associated with the pH of the urine for this class. It is good to know here that we've got acid. You might see something called calcium oxalate as the crystal type, and then you'd see that in a diabetic patient, uh, or oxalate-rich food, people that have ingested a lot of that, like garlic. You'd have to eat an awful lot of garlic to form a stone from that. And another type of acidic crystal is uric acid. This one very common. And we could see that this would be where we would see this in a gout patient. Remember gout is usually in the great toe uh, joint, uh, leukemia, and in hyperine metabolism quickly, uh, you know, hyperine rich, purine rich foods, like actually like beer. Beer is a very high purine content food, and uh, chronic nephritis, which is has different etiology. So let's look at, and then just to note where the staghorn is, where that alkaline one is, excuse me, that staghorn cal calculus is here under the alkaline. So here's one, here's the calcium phosphate, and then here's the calculi uh, stone formation. And I think of, I think a staghorn is alkaline. It doesn't say staghorn on there, but I think that's correct. Anyway, none of this is on the exam. This is just to show you for your own reference. You'll need to pay attention to things that are highlighted on your normal slides. 
right? So we do have abnormal crystals associated with acid or neutral urine. And so if the urine is neutral, remember that the range of urine is 4 to 8 point, I'm sorry, 4.5 to 8. So, you know, pH doesn't always tell you that the person has uh, crystals. So let's look at our uh, sheet that we've come up with and see what our diagnoses are. So here, we've got our chart, and we can look at our chart and see here that, let's go back and look at each one of these patients, and I'll show you the positives one more time. Now, I've filled in some of the things we did not test, like erythrocytes, the presence of red blood cells in the, in the urine, or leukocytes, the presence of white blood cells to indicate an infection in the urine. And then we didn't test crystals, um, but these are things that we have uh, that I would have given you in, in the laboratory. I would have given you the results. So I went ahead and filled them in. And let's look at these and then come up with some possibles for diagnosis. Okay. So patient number one, that male who's 54, let's look at how his urine played out here. So it's yellow, clear. It had a 5 to 6 pH. And note that the normal is 4.5 to 8 it was negative for red blood cells, negative for white blood cells, and negative for crystals. It was also negative for protein and negative for sugar. Remember that negative for both the um, biuret and both the Benedict and biuret, the negative was green for those. So for biuret for protein, uh, negative, and Benedict for glucose, negative. So patient number one is really our control patient. And the diagnosis for um, Mr. Rollins is normal. All right, so that's that's a diagnosis for our patient. He was really the control, which means we'll base the other patient outcomes off of his normal urine sample. All right, let's look at patient number two, Miss Callahan, and Miss Callahan. If you'll note here, she was a 39-year-old female. And we're thinking, let's look at the urine is yellow. Uh, the clarity is clear. But check this out. The pH was very basic, wasn't it? So the pH is basic. And so she's positive for erythrocytes. And she has a high pH. So that means she has a very alkaline pH. She was negative for leukocytes. So we don't, we do have red blood cells, but we don't have white blood cells, right? Um, so th this doesn't necessarily mean she doesn't have an infection. It just means that the white blood cells are not kicking in in this one. And this is actually going to be, let's get down to the bottom and I'll tell you what it's going to be uh, with the presence of a basic urine and red blood cells. She is negative for white blood cells, crystals, and protein and glucose. The fact that she has a, a basic urine, a very alkaline urine, with being positive for erythrocytes indicates she's got some kind of itis, uh, like urethritis or um, urinary bladder, like interstitial cystitis. So that would be my question with her, was perhaps interstitial cystitis, which is a bladder inflammation where the lining of the bladder is irritated cons uh, constantly. And so there, there's some red blood cells shed with that. Or she could just have a, a urinary tract infection. So a urinary tract infection also, right? So we'll just think of UTI for her. Now, let's look at Miss Johnson. Miss Johnson's the 26 year old who had that kind of amber colored urine, but amber's not necessarily uh, abnormal. Remember, the urine could be yellow to amber in color and still be all right. She did have that kind of strange precipitate at the bottom, even though the urine itself looked clear, the precipitate at the bottom just to the naked eye, even though it looked clear to me. Of course, the precipitate tells us that it's not. And 
I'm just going to circle that. And note that the pH of Miss Johnson's urine was pretty acidic, right? So three to four. Three to four is pretty acidic. What are we thinking about with her? She had no red blood cells, but she did have white blood cells. She did have white blood cells in the in her urine. I'm going to change this U R U T I. Looking at these two, let's change this to bladder, uh, which was my initial thought. Looks to me as though our friend over here, Miss Johnson, probably has the UTI, if that's what the presence of the leukocytes tell us, and that Miss Callahan more likely has a bladder infection which is what interstitial cystitis is. This is a chronic condition, and this could be acute or chronic, the bladder infection. Okay, so that's red blood cells. Let's, let's continue with Ms. Johnson over here. We had that precipitate and the three to four acid pH. Um, we've got no red blood cells, but we do have leukocytes in her urine was this deeply orange red color. Remember that? When we tested it for protein. So her biuret test was very positive, was a distinct positive for protein. So she's got two things going on. She's got white blood cells and she's got protein. So we need to come up with two possible reasons. Um, well, at least two, one for each of those that she could have going on. She's negative for sugar. So let's think about uh, the first one with the leukocytes, with the white blood cells. We could say that that might be a urinary tract infection. So that's where we're going to go with her. The operative word being infection instead of itis. So over here, just to point these two out, the patient with the red blood cell, she has an itis, she has an inflammation. And that can irritate the lining of the bladder and cause the bladder to shed red blood cells with the swelling of the vessels. Uh, and also, well, anyway, let's look at the urinary. The word infection should tell us that there's white blood cells, which there are. Okay, and then that orange-red color. Let's address that. That orange-red color for Miss Johnson is the presence of protein. Now. Reasons Miss Johnson could have protein in her urine. Uh, she might. So the protein, so the infection was white blood cells. The protein, mm, does she have a high protein diet, perhaps? We need to ask her some more questions, don't we? Well, what's the other thing that we might want to look at? You know, the difference between these two patients, they're both women. Uh, this patient is 39 and this patient's 26. Not to say that a 39 year old cannot be pregnant. We know that that is perfectly uh, acceptable and happens a lot. But this 26 year old, she's uh, exactly the age for being pregnant as well. So in addition to asking her about the high protein diet, we might need to do a pregnancy check with her. By doing so, we mean we need to ask her about it, and then if she consents, we need to let her take a pregnancy test, right, for the human HGH. Okay, so that was Miss Johnson. Let's look at our last patient, Mr. Maxwell, the 42-year-old. Now, on the sheet, it tells you that he had back pain. It tells you that he had back pain. And by back pain, we could be thinking about pain. We'd have to see where it was. But if it was uh, low back pain or if it was lateralized to around the kidney area, we could start putting a picture together here of this. He has crystals in his urine. And also his, his urine was kind of normal, really. But remember, it could be neutral or acidic in order for someone 
and he's got cloudy in order for uh, someone to form a certain type of crystal. And so let's think about Mr. Maxwell as having that back pain due to the presence. And he had a, and he had a positive he had a positive sugar or a positive glucose test too. So we're going to come back to that. So back pain due to what do you think? With crystals, we could say back pain due to renal calculi. or kidney stones, right? So there's back pain. That's the first diagnosis based on these presence of these crystals. And then the second thing we need to address with him, he doesn't have any protein in the urine, but he did have glucose. He did have a lot of sugar. This one settled out a little bit, but he did have the presence of glucose in the urine. And so we also need to take up the conversation about diabetes with him and maybe have him do a, a fasting glucose test and or a shift test. So diabetes, mellitus, that could be the other diagnosis for him. And so here, I was just trying to show you that your patient can have, let me circle that because he could be normal or pH, but acidic and normal was one of the parameters in the slides. So here's our, here's our first patient. That's our control. Then we've got the female patients, the first one, 39-year-old with a basic uh, pH urine, but positive for red blood cells. So we're thinking about an itis or an inflammation that causes a little bit of bleeding. So that would be a bladder inflammation or an interstitial cystitis. We're looking at patient number three here. There was a precipitate, which turned out to be protein uh, or leukocytes. I don't know which. And the leukocytes, meaning uh, this person had white blood cells present, so that's an infection. The pH was also very acidic. And the protein turned out, remember the red presence of the red, pro the red protein for beer birette tells us that we need to address both the white blood cell presence and the presence of protein. White blood cell being infection and protein being perhaps due to either a high protein diet or pregnancy. And then our last patient, Mr. Maxwell, the male with the back pain, has a normal urine uh, pH, but has crystals in the urine, uh, which could go along with the normal or neutral pH. Slightly acidic though here, right? Yeah, below seven. So we're looking at an acidic normal somewhere along there. Has the crystals present? And then we're going to address that as far as having renal calculi or gout, depending, right? And has glucose, right? So this was our, did I show you the wrong one for that? All right, so had our yellow orange for the presence of glucose. So that was our Benedict's where we had to boil it and we'll see that yellow orange is present in that patient. And that patient might have back pain due to kidney stones. And then that sugar, that glucose tells us that we need to do some more tests for maybe the condition of diabetes mellitus. All right, hope that was helpful.